How's it going, everyone? And welcome back to Rangers Rundown. Before the season officially starts on Tuesday evening, I wanted to do a quick video just to kind of wrap up the preseason, talk about where the Rangers ended last season, and try and answer some questions that we may have for the start of this season. So to hop right in, let's recap what happened last season. 52, 24, and 6 was their record at the end of the regular season, which was 110 points, which was good enough for second in the Metro, only behind the Carolina Hurricanes. The good stats-wise for this team that came out of last season, by the end, they were second in goals against only letting in 204, again, behind the Carolina Hurricanes. They were also second in goals against per game, only letting in, on average, 2.49 goals a game, so just under 2.5 goals per game for the Rangers last season, letting in to their own net. And yes, a lot of that had to do with the fantastic play of Igor Shesterkin, but it is a team game, and the Rangers have a pretty solid decor. They were fourth on the power play at 25.2%. So if at any point last year the Rangers had four power plays in a game, they were pretty much guaranteed to score at least once. And then, of course, seventh on the penalty kill at 82.3%. Fantastic special teams for the Rangers last year. Let's hope that pushes forward into this year. The not-so-great stats for the team last year, shots on goal, they were 28th in the league. They were only better than three other teams, four other teams. Uh, last year with shots per game, 29.2. They were generating fewer than 30 shots per game on average. Now, the Rangers had decent goal scoring, especially on the power play, so occasionally they were able to outshoot or outscore their problems. And then, of course, having for Sh Shesterkin as a goalie uh, doesn't hurt. But the shots on goal need to really move up. Uh, there's a lot of players on this Rangers team that are either pass first or they're very selective with the shots they take. I think the Rangers just need to start putting pucks on the net because shooting the puck to the net is never a bad decision. Overpassing is a bad decision. Waiting too long and getting the puck stripped away from you is a bad decision. But throwing the puck on the net, fluky goals happen almost every single game in this league. So get the puck to the net. Rangers also ended last year 24th in the faceoff dot, only winning 48.1% of their faceoffs. Below 50%, you don't really want to see that, but the Colorado Avalanche, who won the Stanley Cup last season, were also below 50% in the faceoff dot by the end of the season. Do faceoffs matter? No. Do the right faceoffs matter? Absolutely. We saw that in the previous game against um, the New York Islanders, where the Rangers were losing very key face-offs. And those are the ones that you want to win. The Rangers struggled to do that all throughout last season. In terms of individual stats, Panarin led the team in points with 96. Couldn't quite get to that 100 points. He did miss a couple games at the end of the season. Goals leader, obviously, Kreider, with that astounding 52 goals. Uh, good for third in the league. Assists was also Panarin with 74, and then Shesterkin's stats, I just wanted to put them up there. Since he won the Vezina Trophy, 36 wins, 13 losses, 4 overtime losses, 2.07 goals against average, and a 9.35 save percentage. Led the league in both of those categories, one of the reasons he won the Vezina Trophy. That's last season in a nutshell. Moving into this season, one quick trade to talk about, and I know this was, you know, a couple days, weeks uh, ago that Lundqvist was traded, but I did want to put it into a video officially. Lundqvist is officially a member of the Dallas Stars, and I've seen some Dallas Stars highlights pop up on my Twitter feed, and Lundqvist has played decently well for them in this preseason. Uh, the Rangers got two conditional picks back. Um... Conditional picks, meaning that it could be one thing, it could be another. So the conditions are the Rangers will get Dallas's first round pick in the 2023 draft unless it ends up in the top 10. If it does end up in the top 10, that pick will stay with Dallas and the Rangers will get Dallas's 2024 first round pick regardless of where it ends up. 
So if the Dallas Stars do really well this season and their first round pick for 2023 falls below the top 10, that will be the Rangers pick. If the Dallas Stars do not do well this season and their first pick ends up in the top 10, Dallas will keep it. Rangers will get wherever Dallas's first round pick ends up for 2024. First round pick regardless, Dallas is probably not going to be one of the 10 worst teams in the league this year. So the Rangers can look forward to their first round pick in the draft coming up. They also have one more conditional pick in that. It is a fourth round pick in 2025. Now that pick becomes a third round pick if Lundqvist has 55 or more total points over the next two seasons. If Lundqvist hits his stride and finds his groove with the Stars and has back-to-back -back solid seasons, that fourth round pick could be bumped up to a third round in 2025. So that wraps up the Lundqvist trade. And now we get to the opening night lineup. I wanted to put a lineup on the board that I was extremely confident would be the opening night lineup for the New York Rangers, but I've really struggled understanding where Gallant is going to put some of these guys. So the names in blue are the ones I am 99.9 to 100% positive this is where they will be. The names in black... I wasn't so sure, especially after this last preseason game against the Islanders. Who do I think is going to start opening night? Definitely Kreider is a banerjee, but who is going to play with them on this top line? Last night it was Kako. It could be Jimmy Vesey. It could be Sammy Blay. Who, who knows at this point? Of those four names in black, Kako has earned a spot on the top line. But is that where Kako is going to shine? Is that going to make the first line better? I personally don't think so. I think Kako's style is too similar to Kreider's. And I think Lafreniere, Hedl, Kako is a fantastic line. And yes, the Rangers are one top nine forward away from being a complete team. So you end up with this line shuffling. I think if the kid line cooks and they become really solid, you could run your top three lines just as three first lines and just take over any game. But if Kako's on the first line, we don't have a kid line anymore. Panarin and Trocek will absolutely be on that second line. I think Trocek is second line center for sure. Unless he has a poor season and Hedl is on fire, I don't see Trocek and Hedl switching. Unless, of course, Trocek not so hot, Hedl does well. Who's going to be... The right wing on that second line, though. Will it be Jimmy Vesey like we saw last night? Maybe Blay is on the second line. Vesey moves to the third. Goudreau goes to the fourth line. Again, we're not going to know until Tuesday night. Lafreniere, Heedle, one of those four names. I'm hoping it's Kako. But again, if it is Kako, you have somebody on the top line that is not a top line winger. So do you make your third line really strong and handicap your first line? Do you make your first and third line slightly weaker but more balanced? It, it, I'm not an NHL head coach. I have no idea. I do not envy Gallant for making these decisions. And then, of course, the bottom line of Carpenter and Reeves. Who's going to be the left wing, though? Barclay Goudreau, Sammy Blay. We're not so sure. Decor is obviously what it's going to be. That's the most safe uh, besides the goalies, that's the safest part of this roster. Lindgren, Fox, Miller, Truba, Jones, Schneider, exactly where we left it off last season. Gallant was kind of annoying during preseason, being like, oh, it could be a contest. Hayek's fighting his way. He, Hayek was not fighting his way into the lineup. Um, but he will, by all looks, probably be this team's seventh defenseman if they choose to run it that way. And then, of course, Shesterkin and Halak, starter backup. Easiest decision he'll have to make. We also do have Dryden Hunt, who might slot his way into that fourth line. Um, maybe VC makes the team. Maybe Blay is not 100% from the injury he took in the Islanders, so Blay is out the first game and Hunt pops into that fourth line. We could see that. We also have Vitaly Kravtsov, who is still on this team. He's not going to be sent to Hartford because if he goes on waiver, somebody will claim him. Maybe he slots into the opening night lineup. I think Gallant doesn't trust him as much as maybe he was hoping to at this point. Um, but it, you're not going to know how well Kravstov can play unless you put him in the lineup. 
So we might see him in the opening night lineup. My gut says probably not, but we'll have to see. Um, are they going to run a 23-man roster where they'll hold 12 forwards, 6 defensemen, 2 goalies, and then a 13th forward and a 7th defenseman? Do they go with a 13th and a 14th forward and no extra defensemen? Do they just go with one extra forward, no extra defenseman? I don't know, because every if you're underneath the 23-man roster, every game you do that, you save a little money on the cap when you get to the trade deadline. Now, there's a couple situations where the Rangers can kind of finagle the numbers a little bit, and if they carry one fewer man than they're allowed to, by the time they get to the trade deadline, they could have upwards of 4 or $5 million to acquire that top nine forward that they are indeed missing for that push into the playoffs. A lot of things still up in the air. Tuesday night, a lot of those questions are going to be answered. Thursday night, Friday night, even more of those questions will be answered as we push forward through the beginning part of this season. A couple new faces I just wanted to give a little more background on. Of course, Vincent Trocek signing that large seven-year deal with an average annual value of $5.625 million. So not a hugely expensive contract, but a long contract. Will Trocek be a Ranger for the next seven years? He might be, but that contract isn't expensive enough to not think about in three years, four years, how easy it would be to move that contract if the Rangers did want to part with him. And I know that Chris Drury doesn't sign contracts with the thought in mind of, I'm going to trade this guy in four years. So for all intents and purposes, Drury thinks Trocek is going to be a Ranger for the next seven years. And if he does really well this year, I think the fan base is going to be excited about that. Last year with Carolina, he played 81 games. He scored 26 goals, six of which were on the power play, and scored 30 assists, six of which were also on the power play for 51 points. He was a plus 21, and he was 54.62% in the faceoff dot. Trocek will be on that first power play unit simply because he wins faceoffs. If you win a faceoff on the power play, you control the puck, better odds you're going to score a goal. Ryan Carpenter, who will probably make the team. One-year contract with the Rangers, $750,000. Last year, he was with two teams. He was with Calgary and also Chicago. He played 67 games between those two teams. Three goals and nine assists for 12 points and 52.3% in the face-off dot. Most of those stats came with Calgary when he was traded to Chicago. His numbers did take a dip, but that was only for the last nine or so games of his 67. He played most of the season with Calgary, but again, somebody who's comfortable in the faceoff dot and can keep possession on a fourth line where if they can beat down the fourth line of that other team, that's going to give the Rangers' first line some momentum when they hop over the boards. And then, of course, Yaroslav Halak, one-year contract with the Rangers, $1.5 million, a solid backup goalie. For all we know, he should be better than Georgiev. I don't. I know Georgiev had a rough start to the preseason. I don't know how he finished the preseason. I should check on that after this video is over, but I'm not going to be uncomfortable with Halak starting, you know, 20 games, uh, 15, 20 games. We'll see how many Shesterkin wants to play. I think Halak you know, his, his numbers have been going down, but he's also towards the end of his career. But if the Rangers play well in front of him, he is a serviceable serviceable backup. Last year with Vancouver, he played 17 games. Uh, 14 of those games he started. He was 4-7-2 with a 2.96 goals against and a 903 save percentage. Again, those numbers are not stellar by any means. But I think we could argue that the Rangers are a better team than Vancouver. So a goalie to some degree, is only as good as the team that's in front of them. Great goalies will give up a goal if it's a three-on-one. Like, that's just what happens. But I think the Rangers are a little more defensively sound than Vancouver, so Shalak, Halak should have better stats than last year. Some of you have already seen some of my preseason games on the channel, so I won't go too much into this right here, the glory graph, something I wanted to include uh, in this year's Rangers rundown. Very simple, the x-axis, 
the Rangers' effort. So did they play well? Did they play poorly? And then, of course, what was the outcome? Did they win? Did they lose? And I will chart the Rangers' progress throughout the season. So that way, at the very end, once all 82 games are done, we have some data. It is subjective based on my part, but we'll have my subjective data on how the Rangers did. How many of the Rangers' games this season will they win and deserved to win? How many of the Rangers' games will they win and they were lucky to win it? How many of their games did they lose, but it was hard fought? And how many of those games did they lose and they deserved it? So it'll be fun to see come April. The schedule, just very quickly, wanted to go through the, just the whole schedule for the season, make some points about things that are happening. In October, the Rangers will play 10 games, five at home, five away. But three times in October, they will play three games in four nights. So it is a very compact schedule for the month of October, that last three games and four nights spilling into November. 10 games, but very compact for the Rangers. In November, they play 14 games, seven home, seven away. So again, very balanced between home and away. The a West Coast swing is part of that November month and only one back-to-back -back and one three and four. So after October, they just run through the gauntlet of games being very compact. November opens up a little bit more. December, 13 games, seven home, six away, only one three games and four nights for December. January, 12 games, seven home, five away, one back-to-back -back in, uh, in January. So after October, they have a couple months where the schedule relaxes a little bit. Their week off, so their bye week is the end of January into the beginning of February. So we'll have a week off where we don't see any Rangers hockey. We get into February, 11 games, five home, six away, the first month of the year where the Rangers will play more away games than home games. Uh, that's the Western Canada swing is in February, and twice in that month they will play three games in four nights. In the month of March, this is the most jam-packed month of the season, 16 games in the month of March, seven home, nine away, four times in that month they will play three games in four nights as they push towards the end of the season. Hopefully at that point their playoff spot is pretty playoff spot is pretty well secure, but if not, March is going to be quite the gauntlet that they will have to run. Halak is going to have to be very strong in the month of March. And then we get to April, only 6 games, 3 home, 3 away. One time in April they play 3 games and 4 and the season ends on April 13th against the Toronto Maple Leafs. So an early end to the season this year. We'll see the playoffs start in April as opposed to May like we saw last year. So the playoffs will start earlier, which is very nice. These players will have a long, longer off season than they were used to the past couple of years, which will be great for them. Wrapping up this video, I do want to talk about just a couple of questions I have just off the top of my head that still haven't quite been answered yet and we'll see these answers as the season moves forward of course let me know in the comments what questions you guys have or if you absolutely hate my answers to the following questions the first of which will we see the kids primarily Lafreniere, Kako, Heedle, and Miller take the next step now for Miller, I think absolutely. Last season was already an incredible step for Miller. And in this preseason, he's shown no signs of slowing down. So I think Miller is going to be absolutely fine. Heedle has also shown signs this preseason, preseason that he has also not slowed down, slowed down from last year's uh, postseason. If he stays healthy and he can keep this up, Heedle's going to be a spot where we will see major goals coming in. Lafreniere, I just, I hope he gets enough ice time because he doesn't play on the power play. He might play on the penalty kill a little bit, maybe the second penalty kill unit, third penalty kill unit. But if the Rangers have a lot of power plays or they're always playing on the penalty kill, he doesn't get a lot of ice time in the game. And if he's going to stay on the third line, that means he gets a little bit less. So I think if Lafreniere gets a lot of ice time, we'll see his development move up even more. 19 goals last season, didn't quite crack 20, but he was second on the team in even strength goals last year, an area where the Rangers very much struggled. 
and he was second on the team in five-on-five -five goals. If Gallant uses him in the correct way, I think Lafreniere, this could be the season where he breaks out. And then, of course, Kako, he needs to play with the right players. I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about the lineup. I don't think Kreider and Zibanejad are the right players for Kako to play with. He needs to play with Lafreniere and Heedle if he's going to get confidence and show us what a second overall pick looks like in the NHL. Are we going to see the Rangers get to the Eastern Conference Final again? How far will they go in the playoffs? Will they make the playoffs? That seems like a silly question to ask based on how strong this team is. But it's the NHL, you never know. But it's a pretty good chance the Rangers are going to make the playoffs. I'm not saying they won't. They definitely will. How far will they go once they're in the playoffs? Again, that, that, happen, or that uh, depends on who they're playing, that depends on injuries, that depends on momentum at the end of the season, all sorts of those factors going in. I think that the Rangers could make it back to the Eastern Conference Final this season. I think if Shesterkin stays exactly how he was last season, I think if Kreider scores in the 30 goals, and those 20 that he scored last year are made up somewhere else in the roster. I think the Rangers have a very good shot of getting to that Eastern Conference Final again. All you need is a hot goalie in the playoffs and you can ride that pretty far. Will Trocek fit in? We've only seen him play a handful of games in this preseason. We're not quite sure how he's completely gelled in with the team. He has history with Gallant. And he seems to have a little bit of chemistry with Panarin. But again, that's... We'll have to see. The Rangers spent a lot of money acquiring him. I hope it works out. Will Shesterkin win the Vesna Trophy again this season? It's really hard to do that back-to-back, -back, um, unless you're Martin Brodeur. He might, though. Like, if he doesn't slow down, which he's only 26. Like, he's probably still in fantastic shape. And if the Rangers play well in front of him and he is just on every night and he has no more stomach issues like he did that other night in Boston where he was in the bathroom uh, not able to play hockey, if he can avoid that, if he can you know, keep some tums in his locker room and win some games, and he might win the Vezina in back-to-back -back years. I, I really hope he does. The Metropolitan Division is also the Thunderdome, so it's going to be a tough season for all of these teams, especially the ones that are trying to make the playoffs, um, uh, unless they play Philadelphia. Philadelphia is just garbage. How many goals will Kreider score? Definitely not 52 again, although if he does, I will not be upset that I'm wrong. I think he'll score in the 30s, though. I really do, especially if the power play stays as hot as it was last year. I think he and Zibanejad work incredibly well together. I think Kreider will get into the 30s this year for goals. Where else in this lineup will those goals come from? I think Trocek has shown in Carolina last year that he can score some goals. I think Hedl and Lafreniere will score more goals than they did last year. If Sammy Blay can score a couple goals because... He still has yet to score his first goal as a Ranger. He had four assists in 10 games last year. Then he missed the rest of the season. Will Jimmy VC, who looks like he's going to make this lineup, contribute some goals as well? Will Kako start producing those goals that we know he can score? He just needs to shoot more. If everything goes right, and that's the key phrase, if everything goes right, this team is going to be very fun to watch and very annoying to play against for everybody else. But let me know your thoughts. Let me know what I missed. Let, we, let me know what you think I'm wrong about. Let me know if you agree with me. Just let me know how you guys are feeling about the start of this season. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more videos like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next rundown.